and welcome to North Country Matters. My name is Donna Seymour. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of St. Lawrence County, one of the civic partners for our show. Today we're doing a conversation with a candidate. Our candidate is Kevin Berry, who is uh, running for District 7 of the St. Lawrence County Legislature. And with us is Betty Connolly, who is another member of the League of Women Voters to help us do this conversation. Um, I want to start out by saying that conversations with candidates are designed to provide voter education that thoughtfully and civilly discusses the issues of public policy and governance to our community. They're nonpartisan conversations and we invite a candidate to explain his or her positions, records and ideas outside of the 30 second sound bite and the discussion constraints of a debate format. An inv invitation was extended to both candidates for this office. Mr. Barry accepted, so we're very happy to have him uh, with us today. Kevin is the Republican candidate for St. Lawrence County District 7 on the Board of Legislatures, and that is a very large district, isn't it, Kevin? Yes. I've yes. got a map of it here. It includes the towns of Clare, Colton, Hopkinton, Parrishville, Piercefield, and Pierpont. So you take it about probably 20% of the whole county in, in that seat, which is uh, a lot of a lot of territory. Betty, would you get us started? Sure. Kevin, uh, you're a new candidate in the district. Could you tell us what your vision is for St. Lawrence County? Well, uh, I'd like to see the county um, have more success economically. You know, there's a problem here with um, with high property taxes and not enough job opportunities. So you have sort of a double whammy. You have high property taxes and you have people who can't make enough money to pay them. Um, so you have people leaving the county, like you have people leaving New York State in general, um, because they just can't afford to live here. So, and I think that's a shame that people should be forced out of, of the area uh, that they live in because of, uh, because of taxes and because of uh, no job opportunities. Uh, it's a really beautiful area. I really love it here. And uh, I, I, would, I, I would like to see it prosper uh, in, in, in a way that, uh, that, you know, its natural beauty, though, is maintained. Do you have any specifics as to how to uh, you envision this? Well, as far as the economic development goes, I think um, it's, it's a very peaceful, quiet place. It's very green. Uh, it's underpopulated. There's very little crime. So I think it would be a great area for retirees to spend some of the year. Uh, you know, some of the year here, or half the year here, and half the year in a warmer climate. Some people already do that. Um, some wealthier people, you know, are able to afford a house here and a house somewhere else and pay the taxes. But, you know, I was thinking more of um, people who aren't particularly wealthy who might, you know, be retired and want to spend some time here and spend some time in Florida. So I, I had the idea of uh, uh, setting up a, a sort of uh, community of um, um, tiny houses that would be People could live in, you know, like six months a year with the, with, with the associated fees, but nothing too expensive. And that, that they would be maintained. Uh, they would create jobs, you know. Um, a community here, a community there. Something along the lines of a trailer park, but instead of trailers, tiny houses. And for retirees. Um, I think it's important to valorize the local products like maple syrup and um, apples. Cideries, for example. I know there's one opening, I don't know if it's open yet, in um, Norfolk. Um, but I think cideries should be encouraged here. Of course, there already are uh, breweries and craft beer, but the apple and is... Wineries. And wineries. And wineries, but the, but the apple, it's uh, <coughs> something that grows here naturally without much trouble. Mm -hmm. So that's a great thing about it. Um, cider has never really taken off in the United States, but it's taking off now. It's very big in Europe, it's very big in England, it's big in France. And in France they also have what they call Calvados, it's an apple brandy, and it's, it's very highly prized, it's very valued. That's another thing that could be done here. 
Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you know this, but in the 1800s, there was a, a health spa in Messina, Messina Springs, was actually a health spa. And it was known, uh, even before Europeans got there, as a place uh, where Native Americans went to drink the waters when they felt sick. Uh, and it was very successful in the 1800s, and then it, it sort of, the interest in spas declined, <coughs> so this resort declined. And, um, and now nobody knows about it, but there's an interest, again, in the United States in spas, in health spas. And in fact, I, in, fact in Clifton Springs, downstate, there's a spa that works in conjunction with the hospital. And it's, it's very successful. People go there to, you know, to be cured. Uh, so I think that, 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 that would be a big project, bigger than the tiny houses and the cideries, mm -hmm. definitely. But it could revitalize Messina and, and the whole county. Um, the, you know, we're, we're people, we, we're suffering from illnesses now. Everybody's suffering from illnesses, the illnesses, the diseases of civilization. Diabetes type 2. Everybody has diabetes type 2. Kids have diabetes type 2 because they're overweight, right? Um, so it would, it would be nice to have a place where people could take the cure, diet, exercise, and uh, cure their, their diseases of civilization naturally instead of taking, you know, medications to lower blood pressure and this kind of thing. Well, that's, that's a very interesting concept, and um, along the lines of what used to happen in Saranac Lake with the tuberculosis um, clinics that they had up there. Kevin, one of the biggest parts of the St. Lawrence County budget is always the social services budget, and you alluded to the fact that we have um, a, a real dearth of good paying jobs in the county, and that economic revitalization would, of course, you know, help to alleviate that. So. Can you give us some thoughts about what your ideas are on the social services side of the budget of the county and how we might address some of the issues that that presents? Absolutely. The problem is the unfunded mandates from Albany. I think they're about 90% of the, um, the county budget. And the county budget is about 60% of uh, local property taxes, right? All, uh, what are the unfunded mandates there? services that Albany says you have to, county has to provide, but the Albany doesn't pay for all of them. So the homeowner has to make up the difference. And the biggest one is Medicaid, which is a necessary service, but that's about 50%, I think, of, of the county tax. And Medicaid is a federal and state program. And federal, the federal government and the state do pay for most of it, but the shortfall has to be made up for by the property owner, the homeowner, which is insane, in my opinion. It's absolutely crazy. And of course, everybody agrees with me. <laughs> everybody agrees with me, but it's a very difficult uh, cost for Albany to take over because it's so much money. I think, I think it costs homeowners in New York State $8 billion a year. So if this, the, Albany would have to take over this $8 billion. Of course, Albany doesn't want to do that. But even apart from that, it's, it would be very difficult, especially all at once. So I think so, uh, as these unfunded mandates gradually need to be phased out because it can't be done all at once. But it could be done gradually. Um, and until these unfunded mandates are phased out, there can't be any real property tax relief. Um, social services, you know, these are programs that get bigger um, and they have to be funded. Legally, they have to be funded. Hmm? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about infrastructure. There are over uh, 1,800 bridges in the county. And according to uh, the state comptroller, uh, that New York State ranks 14th in the country for percentage of bridges that mean deemed to be poor condition. Uh, those living in Canton or moving through Canton realize what a bridge construction can do just for tra traffic flow purposes. But there needs to be at least work done on, on these bridges. Now, what is your position on fixing and maintaining our county infrastructure, and how would you suggest paying for it? Well, it's a question of, 
obviously the work has to be done. I mean, you have to maintain roads and bridges, otherwise people can't move around. That's, that should be one of the basic functions. That's one of the most important things. So when you, when you ha have money, and instead of devoting it to that, or devoting as much as is necessary, you devote it to other projects, like um, the, building a film hub for $15 million and thinking people will come here and make films. Uh, and nobody comes and then you have to sell it for a dollar. This is money just thrown away. Uh, before you, you put the money into these, um, these um, fantastic projects, you should first make sure the infrastructure works. That's the, that's the, we have to get our priorities straight. Make sure the, the roads are in good shape and the bridges are in good shape. Then you can start uh, spending money on grandiose projects that may or may not pan out and that usually don't pan out. But you can't waste money when there's no money to waste. At least you shouldn't be wasting money when there's no money to waste. So you're referring there to state money, not county money. Where I think what we were interested in is how you would apportion county resources to fix local roads and bridges that may not be eligible for a project like the Canton Bridge was. Well, I tell you, it's, it's, again, it's, it goes back to the unfunded mandates because so much, the county, the, the tax, the property tax money has to, has to legally go to uh, these unfunded mandates, these programs. Legally, it has to go. Certain, a certain number of people have to be hired for certain, you know, services, right? It, it, is Albany saying you have to fix the potholes in this road? Uh, are they mandating that? No. So that gets done last. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Okay. So I think we have a, a good sense of that you are very concerned about the high property taxes, but let's talk about a couple of taxes in particular. In the last term, the County Board of Legislatures raised the sales tax from 3% to 4%, and although a lot of that money does get redistributed to some of the communities in the county, it does hit folks very hard, particularly at the lowest end of the economic spectrum. So do you support did you, su do you support um, that sales tax raise, and would you work to pull it back, or do you think it's necessary? I don't support the sales tax raise because it's a regressive tax, as you say. It hits, the less money you have, the more that extra percent is going to affect you. Right. And the more money you have, you get to a certain point where it, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's not going to make any difference to you. So that, that is a Theoretically, it's not regressive in the sense that if you have a lot of money, you're going to be buying more things, right? You can cut down, uh, or if you don't have the money to buy certain things, you're not going to buy them. You can cut down on your spending, but there are always going to be some basic things that you have to buy, like food and clothing, uh, gasoline for your car. Um, so there are always going to be some things you have to buy, and the sales tax does, as you say, it hits people at the lower... Uh, at the lower le uh, lower income level, uh, and uh, taxes like that should should be should be avoided. Okay, and so uh, to follow up on that, uh, in New York State, the state does not charge their four percent sales tax on home heating oil. The county does, and so uh, most people in St. Lawrence County, I think, would think that home heating oil is kind of a necessity given our long winters. So, where do you stand on that four percent tax? Would you um, keep it or, or remove it? I would remove it because, as you say, it here it we cold winters that uh, oil for people who have oil heat, you know, and there are a lot of them. That's a necessity. That is. Um, that is an unfair tax burden on, on people. That, uh, you know, and you can say, well, why do they have that tax on something like oil that's so essential? Well, that's the very reason they put it there, because everybody has to pay it, mm -hmm. and it's a way to, to raise revenue. But, but it's an unfair way. It's just, it's just not fair. I mean, uh, people spend so much money heating their houses already, okay? I, 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 it, it, sound, it sounds like I'm harping on the property tax, but they have to pay the property tax. It's very high. Then they have to pay 4% on heating oil, which is a big cost for them to begin with, even without the tax. I mean, uh, 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 what, what do you have to do to really drive people out of the, uh, out of the county? What more do you have to do? Keep, just keep raising these taxes. 
people will not be able to pay them. They've already left, and you know, you hear from them, and they say, yes, I'm, I'm down south somewhere, and instead of paying $5,000 a year in property tax, I'm paying $1,000 a year. Depending on what your income is, you know, it's, it's a lot of money. Of course, for a lot of folks, that mobility isn't possible because they don't, they can't move and they may not have the job skill set that people are looking for. So if you're going to reduce the taxes on folks in those two ways, you either have to raise them in another way, raise revenue in another way, or you have to cut services. So are there services that you would cut? What would be on your chopping block? Well, as I said, you know, the mandates make up such a large portion that even if you cut what is not mandated, even if you make so many cuts, you know, that you can cut, it's really not going to make that much of a difference because the mandates take up so much of the... If the mandates are 90% of, of, of county spending, right? Let's say you cut everything else. You would cut 10%, right? So if your property taxes are $5,000 a year, they would be 4,500. And that would be cutting, you know, everything. So again, it goes back it goes back to the mandates. It, you just can't you just can't cut them. And that that's why I mean taxes, you know, they they've gone down a little bit property taxes, but you know, um, as, uh, uh, if more of these mandates are, are made and as, as costs go up for them, then you know taxes will go up again. And of course the county did just uh, release a preliminary budget figure saying that they thought taxes would go down a little bit and right. we are off the list of distressed right. counties, which right. is... Um, great news. It's good. It's exactly. It's great news. Um, a question about employment. According to a 2016 article in the Watertown Daily Times, the largest employer in the county is the government. Now that took into consideration the, fate, the federal, state, county, and it even brought in the K through 12 um, uh, in the public school. But specifically talking about the employer, employment for county workers, um, what is your, uh, do you have a statement on do we have too many, too few? Um, do you have a, a statement you could share with us on that? I don't think there are too many. Um, this is something, you know, if, if, if I'm elected, I, I, you know, would become more familiar with, but uh, I don't think uh, we have too many. Okay, so if you feel that the number is, is pretty much right on target? As far as I know now. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, great. Um, one of the things we want to talk to you about, Kevin, is what has um, been described as the tribalism of national politics. There's so much animosity now between the two parties, and uh, at, at a federal level, things don't seem to be getting done. And uh, so if you got elected to the board, what would be your ideas for working across the aisle and trying to solve the problems of the people of St. Lawrence County and sort of leave party politics at the door? Do you think that's possible? And if so, what are your ideas? I think it's possible depending on the people involved. Uh, my background is in teaching, so I'm used to, you know, communicating with people and getting people to work together. Um, so uh, I think I would be good at working across the aisle. I'm not the kind of person who, uh, when I meet someone, I immediately ask, you know, what is his political affiliation and look at him that way. I'm not a party cadre. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people are. And it's very difficult to deal with a person who, when he sees you, he categorizes you politically and, and decides whether he's going to be friendly to you or unfriendly. And I've met people like that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are not like that. So um, I, I believe in working with people as people. Uh, and some, and then you know, sometimes other politi political considerations will come into the picture. But initially, uh, I certainly try to deal with people as people, and uh, and not as uh, um, as uh, as party cadres or party activists or whatever. Because most people are not. Right. Well, and in fact, in St. Lawrence County, about a third of registered uh, voters are Republicans, about a third are Democrat, and about a third have no party affiliation. So if you're going to represent all the people in your district, you have to look beyond those lines, don't you? You can't, no one can get elected just with the people in their base. They're going to have to look to folks who have other 
uh, political affiliations. So how do you appeal to those folks? Well, usually the, the independent voters, not to be confused with the Independence Party voters, there is a party called the Independence Party, which a lot of independent voters join without realizing they're joining it. Um, so a lot of those members of the Independence Party are actually independent, no party affiliation, um, uh, known in the Board of Elections vernacular as blanks, because the BLK mm -hmm. is the symbol on the voting list, right? And there's so much confusion between independents and independents that the people just are saying blank now to get it straight. These unaffiliated voters, these blank voters, uh, they do tend to go one way or the other as far as political sympathies are concerned. There are those, they do usually, there, there'll be those who have Democratic Party tendencies and those who have Republican tendencies. And I've actually done some research on this. And interestingly, one, th one thing that both sides have in common is that they tend not to like their official party, that they're, they would have that tendency. So independent, blank voters who lean to, towards the Democrats do not like the Democratic Party machine. And the same is true with Republicans. They do not like those leaning towards the Republican side. They do not like the Republican Party. Um, but usually they do have uh, political feelings one way or the other. And they can be quite strong. It's just that they feel that if they don't register with a given party, they are uh, preserving some sort of political independence. But in point of fact, they're actually giving the parties more power because these, these blank voters can't vote in the primaries. So it, it comes up to their voting in the end for the person the Democrats chose or the person the Republicans chose. Um, we want to give you an opportunity to speak to the voters of the district. And what would you want them to know about you uh, when they head to the polls? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely uh, fight uh, for them to do something about these unfunded mandates. I know it's difficult uh, just on the county level, but I do feel that the county legislators should work with uh, state assembly members and state senators, work very closely to do something about these mandates, uh, even, even, with, even with the town governments, because, you know, in the end, it's the people who live in the towns who pay the taxes, right? Um, so I think Albany should be kept aware of what a problem it is for uh, people in the North Country. Uh, every year the legislators go to Albany with a legislative agenda. This year, I looked at the agenda, the, the unfunded mandates weren't even mentioned. I asked some legislators, why didn't you talk about the unfunded mandates? It's the biggest problem. They said, well, we always talk about them, so you know, we felt we didn't have to include it this time. <laughs> But this gives Albany the idea that everything's okay, you know, that the big the high taxes aren't a problem. Um, Second Amendment rights are a big uh, issue here for a lot of people. A lot of uh, residents, members of both parties, are gun owners and they want to continue to be gun owners. They want to continue to um, enjoy their Second Amendment rights. Uh, so I think that's an important issue. Again, it's... it's uh, you know, it's, it's at the county level, it's different from the state level, but still, you know, the county legislators can make sure that the assemblymen, the members of the assembly, and senators uh, are, are, are aware of how important it is for people to be able to have the ability to defend themselves and their families, how very, very important that is for them, and they don't want that right to be taken from them. So that's, that's extremely important. Uh, and one question that you didn't ask me that I thought you might uh, was the, uh, the opioid crisis, as it's usually termed, mm -hmm. um, which is more than an opioid crisis. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a drug problem, and, and I think more, more dangerous than the opioid situation is the uh, methamphetamine situation, because these methamphetamine users are making this stuff in their homemade little labs, which are a bottle that they're putting very dangerous chemicals into, very volatile chemicals, and shaking them up. And they can catch fire, they can explode, and they do. You can watch these videos on YouTube of, you know, fires and explosions. 
If you have an apartment building somewhere, right, and you have one apartment where people are making uh, meth, right, they can cause an explosion, they can cause a fire, they can kill not only themselves, but everybody else in the building. This is really a big problem. And it's not just a question of arresting these people and putting them in jail for a while, because we've been doing that, and it seems that the problem gets worse and worse. So we have to understand the psychological mechanisms uh, that are causing you know, people to, to, to want these drugs. And, and, and if they can't stop taking drugs at this point in their lives to, to get them into some kind of program where they take some kind of substitute, the important thing is they can't keep making this stuff around the county because it's too dangerous. Also for them, you know, mm -hmm. burns, they wind up in the hospital, they have to get treatment over a long time. This is, you know, this is, this is a very expensive uh, proposition in the end. So, uh, yeah, something has to be done to reduce this uh, harm <clears throat> associated with the use of... Um, with meth and uh, also with the opioids and, and you know with other drugs. But one, one of the reasons that I decided to run for county legislator was I was reading about these overdose deaths and I thought this is this is horrible. These young people are dying at such a young age from overdose and it seems to be getting worse the situation and it, it, everyone seems sort of powerless but there must be some kind of way to 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 deal with this. Now I'm not saying everybody can be helped, everybody can be reformed uh, but, you know, an effort has to be made. Some people, they can't be reformed. The only way to reform them, as Mark Twain said in Huckleberry Finn, is, is with a shotgun. With the equivalent today is by putting them in prison, putting them in a cell and leaving them there. That's the way to reform them. That's the only way. Um, but, you know, there, there, uh, there are other people who, who are seeking help, and the help isn't available because there, there aren't enough treatment centers, there aren't enough beds. So that would be another priority of mine. Well, thank you, Kevin, for speaking with us today. I'm sure um, the voters in District 7 will uh, be interested to hear what you had to say. I want to remind our viewers that Election Day is November 6th, and if you need an application for an absentee ballot, it must be ordered and postmarked by October 30th. Elections are decided by the people who vote, so make sure your vote counts. Uh, our time is up. Thank you, Kevin, for coming in. Thank you. This co these conversations are a production of North Country Matters, which is filmed here in the Potsdam Public Library's Fred W. Cleveland Center. This show is a civic collaboration between the League of Women Voters of St. Lawrence County and the American Association of University Women of St. Lawrence County and the Potsdam Public Library. Until next time, remember, our North Country Matters. Thank you so much for coming in. I really Thanks. appreciate it. Thank Very you, Thank you.